Punks, it's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest number 219 at block height 629,658 on Saturday, May 9th. So, what is cracking today, Jenny? Um, well, in the last couple of days, I've kind of been face palming about um, a particular InfoSec cybersecurity issue that has <laughs> popped up. <laughs> Yes, Shinobi is triggered by this topic, but um, many of you have probably heard that there was a certain leak and or hack of a certain video game company called Naughty Dog. And, you know, the details of the game and the whole cultural controversy around it are, you know, that's a giant bag of um, complicated, but... Uh, what we found out recently, because initially when the leak happened, they were calling it a leak. They were saying it was a disgruntled employee who was disgruntled for various reasons, blah, blah, blah. But recently, at least according to the story that Naughty Dog seems to be pushing and or approving of, is that it was actually um, a hack of their company and their build system, uh, whatever they were using. And so that, you know, that happens, that's not a surprise, but um, according to the details that have been released, uh, it appears that the reason they got hacked um, by apparently two different groups who actually informed them, at least one of them informed them of this uh, vulnerability in like February, several months ago, um, they were storing, you know, developer builds or what looks like developer builds in an Amazon web server. And um, they haven't changed their password to those uh, folders where however they were architecting it. They, they, uh, the passwords to access this material have not been changed since I think it was 2011 or 2013, something like that. So many, many, many what? years. And even better, um, the hack did not only compromise uh, the Last of Us 2 material, it compromised other games, like I think one of the, un I haven't played it, but the one of the Uncharted games. And the reason that was possible is because apparently they were keeping material for both games in the same folder. So they weren't even segregating projects into separate servers or even separate folders. They were just mishmashing them together, which... You know, there's a security aspect to that, which is the interesting part to me about, you know, awful password password management. But then there's the project management aspect, which is like, how do these people work on these things? How does a company this big function when they can't even properly segregate their own games? Like, it just... that That has been the craziest aspect of this whole thing to me. You compromise my social security number. I don't care. You compromise my credit card details. I don't care. <laughs> you own my phone and track me every inch, every step I take. I don't care. But you leave the good goddamn video games alone. They're like fucking Bitcoin. Do you have any idea how scarce they are these days? You leave them the fuck alone, motherfucker. I will hunt you down to the ends of Shinobi. the earth and end you. All righty. End you. Well, I mean, if that's if that's all you have to say, um, I guess we can actually move on to Bitcoin-related topics now. You leave the good games alone. All right, so I need to take a minute because I just hyperventilated. Yeah, I think we can all tell. <sighs> okay. So, this 
is a really, really, really fucking cool thing. It actually calls back to literally the first episode of Block Digest, uh, where we covered the initial launch of the Blockstream satellite almost three years ago now, uh, back in 2017. And they've, they've made a lot of changes to that since then, you know, the, the Lightning um, paid broadcast API. But they have completely overhauled the entire data feed and protocol as of May 4th um, to release Blockstream Satellite 2.0. And this is fucking awesome. <clears throat> so um, first part of this, I'm going to slather on a few caveats. Um, this is not an ad. This is not a recommendation. And I am proactively telling you to stop for a minute and look at the cost of the equipment you need for this, getting it yourself and putting it together versus these kits. But they are now selling uh, a basic kit and a pro kit that come with different grades of all the equipment you need except the satellite dish itself to hook up to the satellite feed. And so, you know, for anybody who it really is a worry point you are nervous that you're going to order the wrong thing or you can't handle hooking it all up from scratch yourself um the kit is just a plug and play um box to handle taking the analog signal and converting it to digital from the satellite dish to your computer um and all you need is the dish um and kind of the difference really here uh between the the pro and the basic kit is the um, amount of hardware acceleration and the specs on the box and the pro kit can actually handle connecting to two different satellites um, at the same time if you are in a place where you actually have good line of sight for that and receiving um, a feed from both satellites to actually pull data down faster because they're in a slightly different sync and the the pro kit can actually just directly hook up um, through Ethernet into a network, and you can broadcast that data to multiple devices on a network rather than the basic kit you just plug directly into your own PC, um, and it's anything would have to be delivered from that. And they're also selling a flat panel um, antenna dish. Oh, a big caveat here is this only works on the KU band. So a lot of parts of Southeast Asia or Australia, um, this um, dish that they're selling um, with the antenna integrated um, will not work um, for some of the satellites that only broadcast in the C-band. So if you do decide to spend money on any of these kits or equipment, um, make sure that it's compatible and you're not buying a dish for one of those regions where it's not actually going to work. And so um, pretty much on June 1st, um, the entire 1.0 network is going to be shut down. Um, although anybody running that now, you just need to upgrade your software. All of the hardware equipment that you have is still completely compatible with the 2.0. And now the really fun stuff. So um, they've moved the entire data feed over to DVB-S2, which is a communication protocol specifically designed to deliver things like internet content or content, um, TV broadcast and so on over satellites um, and to make a, a much better use of all the different spectrums you can push data down at one time. Um, so you actually get a huge throughput increase out of this as well as a little better of a signal to noise ratio so say it's overcast um, near you um, this is going to make it a lot more likely that you can still get data from the feed uninterrupted um, and to kind of put some numbers to all of this um, there is now 13 times more bandwidth um, available on the feed than previously so the lightning um, paid um, API to broadcast your own messages um, has upped their individual message limit from 10 kilobytes to one megabyte. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute for some of Shinobi's crazy ideas. 
Um, they've also dropped um, a new forward error correction code um, into the Bitcoin fiber, which is what this runs on, that were optimized specifically for satellites. Um, that was from Greg Maxwell and Igor Frere, um, the former, um, or no, the latter um, from Blockstream, as well as a new compression scheme um, from Arvid Norberg and Peter Wooler. And so all of these awesome things compounding into way more bandwidth lead us to the cherry on the top. Um, you can actually do the entire initial block download over the satellite feed. Um, and a, a, a big detail I kind of want to point out here is you should look around if you want to do that or need to do that um, on the documentations for all of this on Blockstream sites, because depending on where you are in the world and what type of angle um, view you have on a satellite, you might need a, a bigger dish in order to actually pick up the initial block download. And this is kind of because the, the way this is working now on some frequencies, they're just continuing to broadcast the current stream of blocks. And it's actually on a whole different frequency um, that the initial block download is kind of just constantly cycling. And talking to a few people at Blockstream right now, it takes around two to three weeks um, for the IBD. But, you know, like I said, depending on where you are in the world, you could need um, you know, anywhere from a, a 60 centimeter to a 90 centimeter dish. So you, you might actually need a slightly bigger dish in order to actually pick up the initial block download stream. Um, but a cool thing here is that they can actually speed that up. Um, and absolutely no, um, software updates are necessary. It's just, you would need a bigger dish to pick up the frequency that is streaming the initial block download faster. So this is actually something that we can get a lot more um, flexibility and kind of extensibility out of without everybody having to update all of their software every time you do that. And, um, okay, I, I need a coffee sip break, one second. Okay, um, so in, in discussions with, with a few people from Blockstream with this, I've also learned that um, kind of bringing more compression into the picture and just working at schemes where, um, you know, some parts of transaction data or the, the blockchain during initial block download, um, you could just not broadcast and a user downloading that would be able to just figure out the data that you didn't broadcast by looking at what you did. And so there is still a huge potential um, increase in bandwidth usage improvements to come that haven't even been gotten to yet with this. So I'm going to circle back now um, to the Lightning uh, Broadcast API upping its message limit from 10 kilobytes to 1 megabyte. A little anecdotal fact that got thrown around all through the big block debates um, is that roughly, you know, a lot of web pages on the internet are around a megabyte. And so how can we scream that we can't have blocks bigger than a megabyte when we download web pages that big all the time? And so I want to take that little anecdote and rip it out of that context and put it in this one. Um, this entire paid uh, API feed for Lightning was amazing when they first launched it in my mind because it was the, the first communications tool to, to, to use for privacy reasons that I, I'm aware of where it is literally impossible uh, to create a social graph out of it. I ping a message over Tor and if that's safely done, then it just comes down the satellite to who knows who, and if it's encrypted, you literally don't know who. Um, and there's no way to figure out both ends of that. Well, they can push a, a megabyte message now. So this is starting to get into interesting territory. Um, could they cost effectively use that 
that feed to pretty much have a better VPN? Could, could they hobble together a client and, and actually monetize this with Bitcoin micropayments to not have your um, website just sent back over the clear on the internet to you after you request it, but to beam down the satellite feed for you to pick up off of a dish so that you can literally just query something through Tor with a very small amount of data efficiently and have that come down the satellite and not even your air quote VPN provider knowing who you are or knowing where they delivered that content to. And I think this is a very interesting direction that they could take this. And the cool thing is, you know, they, they didn't build their own custom satellite and launch it up there. They're renting bandwidth from comm satellites up there. So if they could create or somebody just on top of this could create a service like that, um, they can just buy more bandwidth if this really makes sense and is profitable. So, like, I mean, yeah, just what this has dropped on its own is awesome. It is a Bitcoin service provider um, that can deliver you the entire blockchain to start and a constant feed of it to keep up completely privately for free. And that in and of itself is amazing. But I'm looking at how much they can scale up the bandwidth they have access to potentially. And I'm thinking, hey, could we make a air quote VPN on this? That is a hundred times better than any VPN that it, that is working right now in terms of its privacy model, and I think I think that could get done. All right, rant over. Cool. But I, I mean, like Jenny, like think about that. It's like a VPN is kind of most people's go-to, you know, privacy screen on the internet, and that VPN provider can see everything you do. Why, mm -hmm. why shouldn't we build a VPN where they can't? Yeah, that would be, that would be good because especially uh, when people are possibly trapped in countries that they don't want to be in and want to communicate with people outside in countries that may become increasingly totalitarian in terms of allowing people to speak freely with others, then... Uh, those kinds of things are going to become even more necessary. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm sure that there'd be a lot of like weird complications and like edge cases, but I, I can't really think of anything in theory that would make that unworkable. Like even a, a TLS handshake for SSL, you, you burst your half over Tor and then their half comes down over the satellite and then you burst your half again and you just do that until you have the handshake. And it's so like, you know, I, I just like, I, I have only been thinking about this for a few days now, but it's like, I still haven't really run into an issue in my head that makes me just go, shit, this couldn't work. All right. So yeah, I guess next up is just a just a quick announcement. Um, so Ledger um, and their Nano S and X, I think, um, have both dropped Blockstream liquid support on their hardware wallet. Okay, so how are we going to freak out, guys? Are we, who, who are we going to yell at for having something that isn't perfectly decentralized in a product? So Blockstream, Ledger, we yell at both of them? Anyway, though, <laughs> definitely a yellow ledger. I tried, but you know, I think that this is a pretty cool thing because you know, a, a big issue of mine with Liquid isn't the the trust model of it, which people love to yell about these days. It seems um, that's out in the open and use it or you don't. It's it's the key management. You know, I, I have a little bit of a Liquid. Um, Bitcoin. I actually did the first swap ever um, for main chain coins for liquid coins. It's just a little bit of pocket change, but it's always irritated me that like I I can't put that on a hardware wallet. 
Like I, I just have a wallet dat file saved somewhere offline. And I don't like managing key like coins like that. I, I really don't. I like to have as little to manage as possible. I like to interact with it as securely as possible. And, you know, now there's at least a option um, for people using liquid to do that with. And I'm sure the, the rest of the manufacturers are going to slowly slide into supporting this. But, you know, it's, it's you know, who cares what the, the trust model of this network is? If somebody wants to use it, like they should be able to manage the keys they use to interact with it as securely as possible. So, you know, I think that's a, a valuable thing. I don't know what else to say. I agree. All right, though, you want to you take us into the next one? And I guess we can air a personal dilemma of ours on air. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I was uh, clicking between tabs. Um, so, yeah, I guess it turns out uh, that we are all Zoomers now. Um, because if you haven't heard yet, I don't know how, but uh, Zoom a few days ago, I think this was March or yeah, March, May 7th, uh, they basically announced that they had acquired Keybase. And Keybase is one of the things that at least uh, the Twitter portion of uh, Bitcoin uh conversation uses as kind of, of the you know cutesy uh basic encryption app to communicate um and have reputation stuff so yeah but before we get into that um i wanted to make note of the fact if anyone's not familiar with why we have such a mixed view of keybase um especially their questionable forays into cryptocurrency stuff uh in march 2018 uh episode 87 we talked about keybase's partnership with the stellar foundation which led to the integration of a stellar wallet directly into keybase which we discussed in a different episode in september 2019 uh number 190 and then we continue to re 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 against uh them because of uh, the airdrops that they started doing of Stellar Lumens uh, and in a very rather dangerous manner because they would basically just direct message you with a bot uh, and spam you and I actually had to block it because it kept airdropping me Lumens and I was like no, that's a very bad idea because it's basically built on the same model and messaging that you see with the stupid airdrop bot accounts that are just trying to take people's money. We should not be encouraging that kind of messaging. We should not be encouraging that people should actually accept this. Um, I think it was episode two or three where we celebrated the fact that those annoying and potentially dangerous airdrops of lumens were finally brought to an end for many very predictable reasons, including the incentivization of, you know, actors just creating multiple key base accounts in order to get more lumens. Duh, of course. Um, which, you know, obviously would have a negative effect on their whole reputation system where you look at and you see, oh, this person's followed by a lot of people, but it turns out they're just bots who wanted to get lumens. Um, so, yeah, brief introduction, not so brief, but uh, with this acquisition, um, Zoom published a statement saying, we are proud to announce the acquisition of Keybase, another milestone in Zoom's 90-day plan to further strengthen the security of our video communication platform. Since its launch in 2014, Keybase's team of exceptional engineers has built a secure messaging and file sh sharing service, leveraging their deep encryption and security expertise questionable. Uh, we are excited to integrate Keybase's team into the Zoom family to help us build end-to-end -end encryption that can teach or that can reach current Zoom scalability, uh, end quote. Then um, there's a rather interesting part, uh, which I think we should maybe, you know, talk about because it's related to all of the uh, news about how insecure and badly designed Zoom is. Um, they include like this rather minor but actually significant detail about 
how their clients work and they say today audio and video content flowing between zoom clients zoom rooms laptop computers smartphones running the zoom app um that is encrypted at each sending client device it is not decrypted until it reaches the recipient's devices with the recent zoom 5.0 release zoom clients now support encrypting content using industry standard aes nah, you know keys to 256-bit keys However, the encryption keys for each meeting are generated by Zoom servers. So mm -hmm. I was just, you know, I mean, I mean, this is kind of, it's not a surprise to me, but I, it, they're kind of glossing over the fact that it's like, hey, we're implying that we're doing client to client end to end encryption, but we generate the keys on our servers, which basically makes the whole client to client thing redundant because we could keep a copy of the keys so it's not really client to client i mean it is but not really um which again doesn't surprise me because this is zoom but they kind of gloss over the significance of that yeah as as far as i'm concerned zoom is ccp spyware um like literally all of the the code development is outsourced to three chinese companies um and as far as i'm concerned um i'm bailing on keybase soon and i'm not taking uh an update push that that comes from them under zoom ownership um I, i'm looking already at the the keys.pub um fork of keybase that rips everything off and it, it really sucks because we use keybase for uh stuff for the digest and i mean like aside from like this and the, the shit with stellar I really like the platform. Like it's end-to-end -end encrypted. There are cloud storage units that teams can access. There's private encrypted Git repos. Like there are just a ton of useful ass features bundled in. And the key management is really nice. Like a mnemonic based, uh, you know, key management system, the end user can hold their backups themselves. It's pretty portable between devices. It doesn't require a phone number to get on. It's it's literally like everything I would want on an end-to-end -end encrypted chat platform. But it's like that they did the shit with Stellar and, and now they pretty much sold themselves to a company that makes CCP spyware. So it it, it just fucking sucks. Like it, it really sucks it trying to find something that works good and actually lasts in terms of tools like that. Yeah, I mean, besides the fact that I really hate what they did with Stellar, I think that Keybase, it's it's one of those apps that it, I, I, I would agree that it gets the right balance of, you know, it's usable by pretty much everyone. It's something that, like, it has a very kind of cutesy, baby-looking UI that's very approachable for everyone. And, like, that's that's why, you know, I mentioned the fact that a lot of people on Bitcoin Twitter have it just because it's like, it, I the way that I feel about Keybase, is like you know if i would rather someone if they want to dm me on twitter i would rather just have them send me a message on keybase because it's like you know it's good enough and usable enough that pretty much everyone should be able to do that um whether it's high security enough for any other kinds of encrypted communication questionable but um you know it's kind of that all of purpose app and it's disappointing that they've gone in this direction but also, the thing that really confused me about this acquisition is that um, they didn't really give any details whatsoever about what Keybase was supposedly going to do. In fact, um, in Keybase's acquisition statement that they published, I found it very annoying because it was written for a child. There wasn't really any useful info. I mean, it, when I say written for a child, it was like, they were kind of just walking you through these abstract concepts that there wasn't any useful information like he, you know we got acquired here's what we're going to do here's why they acquired us blah 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 there was no details whatsoever at the very end of a long-winded post they basically say initially our single top priority is helping to make zoom even more secure 
there are no specific plans for the Keybase app yet. Ultimately, Keybase's future is in Zoom's hands, and we'll see where that takes us. Of course, if anything changes about Keybase's availability, our users will get plenty of notice. So our shortest term directive is to significantly improve our security effectiveness by working on a product that that's that much bigger than Keybase. We can't be more specific than that because we're just diving in. Like, to me, that sounds less like an acquisition and more like, a, hey, we're onboarding you as, like, consultants. Like... It's just it's a it, it's a weird framing of an acquisition because usually I mean like they're they're basically they're acquiring the people they're not acquiring Keybase it sounds like at least they don't have any plans to do anything with Keybase and Zoom like it's just it, that's what it feels like to me that it's like a people acquisition not a product acquisition so whether you know whether Zoom is going to be integrated into Keybase isn't even you know, neither of them even gave a definite answer on that, which I feel kind of weird. Like, maybe Keybase was so cheap that they just don't care, and they're just acquiring the people. Um, but, yeah, that's why I don't know really... I mean, I, I don't like the idea of Zoom having any control or influence over Keybase, so that already is putting me off, but it also just it feels a lot less significant based on what they've written. Yeah, it just, it just, it just sucks because it's like, you know, this whole thing, it just kind of shows, and it, I don't really blame them, um, but like the chief motive here was to kind of do the private company thing. Like, let's spin this up, let's do this, and let's put money in our pocket for building this somehow. And it just sucks because it's like, that's the thing that just keeps killing stuff like this over and over when that eventually passes it off to somebody that the users just don't trust <laughs> to actually maintain the service and, and what it's supposed to provide. And it's, you know, I, I'm, I'm really hoping that during all of this and in this kind, cause we're going to see a condensing of, of tech companies like this while the market gets fucked. And you see the ones who haven't really gotten on their own feet yet just try to sell off to not burn. I really hope that we can just eat into that that entire meme of they can just sell off a user base. Like, no, I'm I'm gone. Like, it's just, it's just a matter of how long does it take for me to get out the door? Like, let's do that. Like what, when some service that's actually valuable and ran by trustworthy people sells to somebody who isn't, stop using it. Build an alternative. Like find something that doesn't count on a, on a company providing a service like that. Like stop just going along with this idea that you as a user of some platform are something that the owner of the platform can just sell on to the next guy. Yeah, and that's that's what I find disappointing because... At no point, I mean, I wouldn't have expected Zoom to do this, but Keybase should have had the foresight to think, you know, maybe some of our users are, you know, worried about the fact, like, they would want to be told, you know, is your is the data from Keybase users going to be shared with Zoom? Like, what kind of access are they going to have? I mean, obviously, Keybase should have built its stuff in a way that, you know, there isn't sensitive stuff that they have or could share or is you know marketable in some way but they didn't even consider putting in a statement about you know what's going to happen to user data whatever they do have they didn't even think about that which makes me feel like either they don't care or they or they don't want to say <laughs> Like, either of those is not good. Yeah. I mean, my read of the situation is, I mean, I can't see with Keybase's architecture what is at risk in that way except social graph connections. But it, it's still like, what the fuck? It's, it's, and it's also, like, the, their attitude could very well just be the users will leave all of their data except that is encrypted. I don't care. But it's like... 
well, now everybody has to go find something trustworthy now. Um, like it sucks. And it's like, I, I can't remember the last time like I found an encrypted chat app or something that I like using that I feel safe in using. And in a couple years later, it's gone and I have to go find a new one now. Oh man. Okay. So I have a story to tell you children. It's a true story that comes from China. It's not made up. This actually happened. <laughs> so all of you should know and be familiar with um, the kind of civil war going on in Bitmain over, say, the last six months or so uh, between the two CEOs and founders, uh, Ji Han Wu and McCree Zan. Um, and a quick TLDR is Ji Han was the Bitcoiner and the business guy. Um, and McCree was the hardware engineer who wanted to build deep learning chips. And they kind of just came together with, well, we can build Bitcoin chips and make money, and then McCree can do that. And obviously, that, that started fracturing the more that Jihan decided to put the entire business at risk to push Bcash. Um, and got us to the point where um, McCree was actually removed from control of the company, um, but then reinstated um, because the process to do so was not entirely legal. Um, so Jihan kind of came in, took control for a little bit, and then that was negated through legal channels. Um, well, a day or so ago, McCree Zan, and I, I forget the, the name of this organization, um, but it, it's a, a communist party um, bureaucratic um, institution to deal with like business ownership records and, and that kind of shit, um, went to this office um, to get a physical copy of the document showing that he is the legal representative of Bitmain. He was followed by 10 other um, pro Jihan Bitmain employees, including a man, um, Lixin Z, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, who Jihan is claiming is the legal representative of Bitmain when he's not, um, and tried to just physically steal the document from McCree that he went there to get as if that would actually have any effect on the legal reality of things. And in a Chinese Communist Party government building started a fist fight with McCree and got himself arrested. So just to be clear there, um, Lixan, the, the person Jihan is claiming is in charge of the company, um, got into a fist fight with McCree Zan the person who actually is in a communist party building and got arrested. And so, yeah, that's a thing that just happened. <laughs> Another point in the uh, civil war history of the thing. So when IPO. <laughs> yeah, great timing. It, it, it's just like it, it, that company is done. Like they're, they're dead. It's a matter of how long does it take to wind up in a casket in the ground. And it's just like the most hilarious story in Bitcoin's history. It was like an unstoppable company who could have just dominated one of the most foundational aspects of the Bitcoin ecosystem if they were just not idiots. And just dominated that for years to come and they just lit it all on fire with a shit coin and now they're literally getting into fist fights in chinese communist party buildings <laughs> over who's in charge of the company this is the best timeline the best all right you want to just jump into the next one you need ruh -ruh. Ooh, forgot to do the mic again one second all right. Uh, well, next. Oops. The, the, Wait, this is, is it your story next? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, the the next uh, mining one. Um, oh, okay. Sorry. This one, I actually, I don't, I don't really know what to make of this, but I, I want to say I was actually approached with somebody who brought this to my attention, who 
is concerned about this being used as a source of information to push narratives. But um, the University of Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance is now operating a Bitcoin mining map um, showing approximate geographic distribution of Bitcoin hash rate all over the world, um, starting from around September 2019. Now, the, the thing that kind of has me a little skeptical here is that all of the data for this is purely coming from btc.com, Poolin, and via BTC. So this is only sourcing data from three Chinese mining pools that only have about 37% of the total hash rate. And in, in this, this I do want to say, um, in their own methodology page, they point out the kind of assumptions and shortcomings here. But you make two major assumptions aside from um, just trusting that the data that the mining pools are giving you is truthful and accurate. Um, you make the assumption that the distribution globally of hash rate in that or those specific pools is statistically a, a good sample of everything, that they have the same distributions that all of the other mining pools do as far as who, who from what part of the world is mining with them. And two, um, you assume that nobody's using proxies or VPNs or any kind of tools to obscure their IP address, which is what they're using to kind of geolocate things in this uh, data set that they're putting together. And we can already see the this is kind of being linked all over the place with the narrative, all of the, the hash rate is in China. And... Honestly, I am kind of skeptical of this, and they are proactively reaching out to other mining pools to gather more data um, that isn't solely sourced from China. But let me put it this way. Uh, the person who approached me with this, I think, is entirely right in that this data is going to be used to flare up the whole all the mining is in China, be scared narrative. Um, but I do think that a lot of the data in here is probably, um, accurate and probably statistically relevant, um, for two reasons. Um, mostly that I the the, the statistical distribution of sampling from a few pools, the miners I know, and I'm aware of, like, it's, it's not uncommon at all for an actual physical mining farm to spread certain amounts of their hash rate over different pools. Um, so I think that it is very likely that statistically the, the pools that have been sampled providing data from China here are very likely within a decent margin, a statistically representative sample. And two, I just do not really see miners who are relevant to a, a thing like this at scale um, with hash rate that really matters <clears throat> using proxies or VPNs of any significantly geographically disconnected way because every millisecond is theoretically money. Every hop of added latency that you're tacking on to your block getting where it's supposed to go is money you could lose. And so I don't really see that being a significant skewing in the statistics either. But, you know, just to wrap this off, you know, at the end, every time this whole narrative has come up, I point at the illegal ore smelting business in China which the, the Communist Party has been trying to clamp down on and stop for forever, that makes up almost a third of like refined like aluminum or like cheap metal exports in China. Um, you know, that, that hash rate spread all over China and a lot of it particularly is in the Sichuan province in very remote mountainous regions that it's, it's, it's not the easiest thing in the world to just snap your fingers and just go do something without people noticing and being able to react. 
And so it's like, honestly, I don't know. I, I'm going to be watching this site very closely to kind of see how this evolves and how they're able to source new data and how that affects things. But I, I absolutely think the person who brought this to my attention is right, that you're going to see a lot of pointing at this and a lot of China narratives when it comes to miners. All right. And I think that uh, slides into your thing next. Uh, I have to keep remembering to click on Mumble. Um, yeah, so uh, probably the most interesting story to me today is that um, and I've seen a number of people point this out, but one of them was the Hong Kong-based Bitcoiner, uh, Leo, is it Leo Vies or Weiss? Do you, is it? I'm so confused because as a German, I see all W's as V's. Um, I, I don't know. I Let's don't go know. with V's. Um, so he pointed out on Twitter that the number of onion services slash onion addresses that have, um, like the, the number that are online has been increasing steadily recently. Um, he pulled, uh, graphics from the metrics page of the Tor project, which show that, um, on one hand, onion service traffic has gone up from about... Uh, one gigabit per second in 2018 to almost four gigabits today. And while the number of unique onion addresses has been vacillating between about 60,000 and 125,000 for all of 2018 and 2019, it started to spike around the beginning of 2020 and is currently hovering closer to 200,000. Um, so that's almost, almost a doubling. Um, and so Leo asks, how much of this is due to efforts in Bitcoin projects such as Core, LND, and BTC Pay, um, making it trivial to connect via a hidden service? And the reason that's relevant um, is that there has been a certain uh, clickbaity crypto media outlet that has recently published an article about how the total Bitcoin node count is at, quote, three-year lows. And while it is entirely possible that maybe the Bitcoin node count has gone down for various reasons. Um, there was no consideration. Well, there has since been consideration after people pointed this out, but in the writing and publishing of the article, there, there was no consideration included for the fact that maybe the drop is actually just Bitcoin nodes shifting to Tor only connections and therefore their existence would be somewhat obscured by the practical reality that if you have Bitcoin nodes on the Tor network, you are going to be exiting through a smaller number of exit nodes and you will appear as one or very few IP addresses. And so it won't pick up on the fact that that is actually multiple Bitcoin nodes, which Practically, that is a good thing because it means it, their presence is being obscured on the network. But when you are dealing with very simplistic metrics, uh, like just total Bitcoin node count based on IP address, then those things are not going to be picked up on. Um, and the so it's important for two reasons. One, it shows that, I mean... The problem with this question, like, is the Bitcoin node count going down or is it moving to Tor, is that it's hard to answer that question when, you know, the whole point of using anonymity and privacy tools is that that kind of stuff becomes harder to measure, just as the number of lightning nodes and the number of transactions and the amounts being transacted is going to become harder to measure as people use more of the privacy features and tools. Um, but what's really annoying and disappointing about this whole thing is that, you know, those were th considerations that should have been top of mind. Like if anyone knows anything, that would have been my immediate assumption is that it's possible that they're just on tour and so they're harder to measure. But instead of doing that thinking, a lot of uh, people, especially Ethereum people I've noticed, have taken this as an opportunity to say, oh, Bitcoiners are virtue signaling when they're talking about running nodes because look, they're not actually doing it. When in fact, it's uh, more likely that they are in fact doing it and, or at the very least, the existing nodes are doing the right thing and using anonymity tools that will make the network more resilient and safer to use and more private. 
Um, but no, we are just virtue signalers. Um, apparently that was the takeaway, and it's so annoying to keep seeing this over and over again because whether or not people want to use their brains, they are ruining the brains of everyone else who reads their garbage. I definitely think that Bitcoin is a huge part of it because you just, you know, yeah, there, there's way too much uptick in node launcher wrappers and things like BTC pay all just hooking into Tor. Like it has to be, but I think like some of this has nothing to do with Bitcoin and just the general shit going on with a lockdown everywhere. And I just don't even know where to begin, like trying to figure out how much of it is which, you know what I mean? Well, yeah, I'm not I'm not saying that, like, what the claim about whether Bitcoin st related stuff makes up the majority of the increase in Tor traffic. That's a different question. But the the point is, there is an increase, which means there is, you know, we can make mm -hmm. the reasonable assumption that the drop in Bitcoin node count could also be happening in tandem and be related to and causing a section of the increase in Tor traffic. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it is it, it is going to be a weird thing because, you know, I I really hadn't even thought about that, um, like, explicitly until you kind of put it that way. But I'd been thinking something similar just in the general logic of, like, how do you actually use a node? um unless you're hooking a light wallet up to it you're probably just spinning it up to make sure some money showed up and then turning it back off again like unless yeah. you're you know what i mean unless you have some reason to need it online to do something with it all the time like that's probably what you're doing yeah i mean it would depend i mean if if any of these people are are looking at the number of bitcoin nodes on the network on a long-term basis and not just you know popping into a metrics page and saying, oh, look, the number has gone down. Um, it would depend on whether anyone has seen, because like there, there's a there's a certain, you know, number of Bitcoin nodes that they're just kind of always there and they don't, a certain percentage that is consistently online, it doesn't really drop out. Obviously, when you get, you know, when Bitcoin is you know, more prominent in the news, you have people just randomly downloading the client to see what it is, and they obviously don't remain online for very long. Then there's other people who, for whatever reason, they don't want to run their node constantly, and so they might turn it off for periods of time and then come back on later. So it would depend on if anyone saw, you know, did you see that core percentage of bitcoin nodes that are usually always on did those actually start to leave because i would assume it would be very weird especially considering you know the price movements and everything going on that you would have that core group of nodes going away now like my i would i feel like that's better evidence for the fact that they're just probably shifting more to tor instead of dropping out altogether mm -hmm. yeah you just i don't know you i just i have paid so little attention to shitcoin narratives about bitcoin lately i hadn't even really thought about how easy it would be to eviscerate that one until you just spelled it out like that yeah i mean i'm not the i'm not the first one i just i looked at the uh the article which i will not name uh, from the unnameable crypto media service. And as soon as I saw it, it just made me annoyed because I could tell the intent behind it was to promote this thing about how people say to run nodes and they say, oh, nodes are important, but then they don't actually do it. And it's like, okay, but what? It, it, it's such a weird criticism because then you look at some of the projects that these people are related to or heading or working on and you know not only do they not have that emphasis but they have a much worse situation in terms of the decentralization of their network because people aren't even able to run nodes because it's too difficult so it's just so weird oh should we just hop along to the next one
Yep, hop along little doggy, I think the phrase goes. Or hop along little monkey, in your case. All right, and the monkey's off. Uh, so a little while ago, uh, I talked about a proposal from Commerce Block. A, uh, I'd say they're, they're kind of doing the same thing as Blockstream. Uh, a company working on sidechain platforms uh, for state chains. And the, the catch is uh, they designed a variant of a state chain that assumes that we never get L2 or SIG hash no input. And back, back when I first touched on this on the, the show, it was just kind of a, a general idea of how you could do that by using time locks in a different way and multi-party uh, computation for ECDSA signatures um, as opposed to L2. Now they have released both an implementation and a full specification of their Mercury state chain protocol, uh, really spelling out all the nitty gritty details here. Now, really the, the gist of this to kind of brush up is that instead of being able to um, just count on the sequence number as interpreted with L2, uh, where a higher sequence number can just always spend an older one and guarantee that money goes to the right place. Um, this has to kind of fall back on a trick from older payment channel designs where you just start with a very long time lock and then in the next payment or state update, you shorten the time lock a little bit. And you kind of have this reverse counter going to zero, at which point you have to um, close this payment channel because there's, there's no way to guarantee that any new state could hit the chain and confirm before a previous one that could try and steal money. The other half of the trick is relying on um, pretty much crypto magic. Um, so multi-party computation um, protocols that you can implement with ECDSA signatures to do the kind of interactive signing um, in a, in a sort of way that you do with uh, Schnorr signatures, where you effectively have a, a multi-sig that isn't so much a script program as it is just two uh, separate public keys added together and a uh, more complicated way of signing um, with two halves of that uh, corresponding private key without ever combining them. And so this to, to kind of brush up on state chains in general involves putting a UTXO into a forked construct, which in the original proposal would actually be the script in a UTXO, but in this case is just the pre-signed transactions. Um, you would initiate the creation of this uh, Schnorr analog public key where the depositor with the state chain entity and the state chain entity collaboratively create a single public key that they both have half of the private key to. And then from this point um, would also create a pre-signed transaction um, giving the depositor their money back after the longest uh, time lock possible um, that they want to agree to um, that spends a um, first pre-signed transaction um, from this, this new kind of Schnorr analog key that they've created together. And the interesting thing here is you're kind of emulating um, the trigger transaction in um, the L2 channel construct, um, 
by having the the initial output that's locked on chain um, with this collaborative key um, and then a pre-signed transaction spending from that collaborative key into a collaborative key and then a pre-signed transaction that is time locked uh, spending from that one um, to the actual owner of the state chain and now this way um, you can engage if you want to transfer the state chain to somebody else a collaborative back and forth procedure um, with the state chain entity and the the two transactors to i think that the most succinct way to put it is you kind of go back and forth in a crypto magic dance um, without anybody fully revealing their shard of uh, a private key that corresponds to this um, originally created collaborative public key. And you kind of wind up um, in a place where the state chain entity now has um, a half of a private key with the original depositor and then a new half of a new private key with the person that the original depositor is sending it to and both of those sets of, of shards of private keys correspond to the same public key and so at this point assuming that you trust the state chain entity they just delete their half of the, the private key um, pair with the original depositor. And they are literally not able to even sign uh, for a previous state chain holder um, to defraud a current one as long as they actually do that. And that's actually something and a behavior that's possible to port to Ruben Sampson's original design with Schnorr as well. And now the other half of the state chain is um, the state chain, uh, the whole thing that it gets its name from. And that's kind of just this parallel um, kind of blockchain of its own that's just a receipt of who has handed a state chain to who that the sender, the receiver, and the state chain operator all sign off on and um, a holder of a state chain keeps and the the idea is that as long as you have your your copy of the state chain if the operator of that state chain uh, colludes with a previous owner um, to defraud you you have a definitive cryptographic proof that they colluded in a fraud and therefore they're an untrustworthy operator of a state chain now the interesting thing there is um that still doesn't really preclude the potential um theoretically of multiple state chains being passed around or spent um you know kind of double spent like uh that that actual just receipt record um isn't duplicated to two different people and that two different people don't have the the same sequence number or same um, spot in that state chain valid pre-signed transaction that would be in a double spend raise you have to kind of trust that the uh the state chain operator isn't doing that while using the mainstay protocol um they actually um, create kind of a canonical timestamp in the Bitcoin blockchain um, recording the current state of every individual state chain that a, an operator is maintaining um, at each Bitcoin block. And so you can not only have this proof that a, um, a state chain operator is you can have a, a time stamped proof of exactly which um, states of, of all the state chains they're operating a, a operator is or isn't committing to. And, and see the, the real value add here 
is um, kind of taking advantage of um, this concept of a uh, a succinct Merkle tree. And pr pretty much the idea is that you, you can canonically order a Merkle tree, um, you know, the equivalent of alphabetically um, based on hash. You know, this is something Bcash has actually done. Um, but the interesting thing is here, you know, that's uh, you have a 256 bit string. Then you have, say, 256 bits worth of possible things to hash into a Merkle tree. What if you don't have a piece of data worth tracking or that, that doesn't mean anything coherent? You just want to denote empty. Well, the concept of this is that any data you do want to, to track in this, you can order appropriately and then just assume zero for everything else and you can actually include a proof of something not being there by just caching all, all of this and if something isn't in there fill in all of the zeros and any actual data um, relevant to the the merkle branch to the the top there and you can prove nothing is there and the, the idea with the Mercury implementation here is to kind of order that um, succinct Mer or Merkle tree by actual UTXO ID um, that uh, has a, a state chain tied to it, and then committing that state chain um, to the actual on-chain Bitcoin UTXO. And so this way you can see um, you know, through this mainstay commitment um, and the operator of that, that there is a single Bitcoin UTXO with a single um, state attested to it um, as far as the state chain tied to it and have a much more objective sense of if you see anything deviating from that, um, that's untrustworthy and suspicious. And you know, I am really kind of interested to see, uh, you know, who plays with this and who wants to try and implement something with this on this. Um, you know, it's it's a real implementation now. Uh, it, it can operate on the actual Bitcoin chain, um, the main chain, as well as any elements based blockchain. And it's running now. And actually digging through this uh, specification, I'm actually kind of thinking through a few dynamics that I wasn't before. Like one, one of my, I think, big, like this is what's going to drive state chains as far as real utility and adoption is lightning routing nodes being able to fill things on, in on the fly. Um, not having a connection right now that would be useful to write a or route a payment right now and being unable to fill in that gap. But with a state chain, completely off chain at the snap of a finger, fill in that gap and just route that payment. Um, this implementation allows that possibility potentially, even if we never get L2 but with very different dynamics whoever first opens a state chain um kind of gets stuck with the longest time lock uh to get the money back themselves if that state chain operator becomes non-cooperative and so that there in and of itself um is a disincentive to put a lot of money in any individual state chain with any individual operator. Now, at the same time, I won't want to accept a state chain maybe um, that was just opened and has a very long time lock if I already have a bunch of um, new state chains with longer time locks. You know, maybe the rational person will want to have as many 
soon to expire state chains in terms of that time lock or ticking towards zero and not so many freshly open ones and balance things in a way like that and like how does that game of hot potato play out if they try um or you know if if, if lightning operators try to apply and use state chains in that way does that limit their utility in that way does it outright prevent it by making it uneconomical or just disincentivizing it overall i mean it, it's kind of weird to think about you know it's this is it's it's something i haven't really personally thought about in a while um seeing segwit roll out and the lightning network um enabled with segwit um the transaction malleability protection the different uh feature sets the future upgradability potentials you know it, it kind of i haven't thought a lot about how limited some of the early payment channel constructs were uh, it, it's just kind of interesting to, to think now looking at the original state chain proposal versus this very fleshed out now alternative assuming that we don't get something the original state chain proposal assumes we did in terms of base layer functionality and it's just kind of interesting like that's a lot more limited like that might play out very differently in practice if say we don't get l2 and this is how we have to to deal with state chains so yeah i mean this is this is it's a cool thing to think about like there's still a lot that's possible even if it's a little more limited um that doesn't involve forking bitcoin for everything and so yeah uh yeah it's uh, been almost 20 minutes so i think we're just gonna hop into the next one okay so this is incredibly fucking cool too um the magical bitcoin project um and it looks like one of the the people doing this is aleko Svalini, um from over in italy he's been working with uh giacomo on the rgb spec um for colored coins uh on and off chain and uh this is a really awesome uh looking project so the goal is to pretty much just build out a collection of tools and libraries uh, to support all the stuff that you would want in a, in a Bitcoin wallet. So like here's like come here to find all the things and decide what you want to incorporate into the wallet you're building um, and eventually build a reference implementation wallet with all of this. Um, to be a modular kind of lightweight wallet supporting absolutely everything that you can really support in a Bitcoin wallet. And uh, this just dropped and is getting kind of fleshed out right now. And they're kind of just working on a, a simple um, command line tool right now um, to work with debugging um, that they've rolled into WebAssembly. And they're kind of working on plugging that into a explorer right now um, as far as where it pulls Bitcoin data from. And they're also working on um, kind of demonstrating the, the descriptors system to be able to kind of uh, categorize and deal with different outputs and um, scripts in them in terms of interacting with UTXOs. And this looks like a really fucking awesome project that i'm probably going to be shilling all the time now because this is addressing like exactly one of the the problems i've always seen in this space in terms of software is like everybody's off in their own corner doing their own thing in their different way pulling tools from different toolboxes and it's 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 decentralized anarchy that happens but it it, it adds so much friction to like trying to connect things together or make them interoperable. And if they can really keep at this and kind of pull in more um, people to participate in this, I think this would be a fucking awesome thing in this space. Like it's not like overnight, everything out there is gonna magically work together, 
but this this is the kind of starting point that would help the new things that haven't been built yet by people that haven't gotten to the space yet um you know build their stuff on the same page when they finally get here and i think that'd be an incredibly valuable thing i mean come on magical bitcoin killer name killer three-year-old hand drawn in paint logo hell yeah Boop. all right and uh next up i mean not really much to say except uh this is happening um but it's that time of year um quarterly stuff is getting declared and yeah <laughs> um so in 20 uh 19 47 percent of cash apps revenue uh was bitcoin sales um which blew up over 210 percent uh from 2018 and I do believe um, the framing was something like a, I think a, a quarter of all of the the Bitcoin that were mined in that period um, were at least balance sheet logic wise with numbers uh, consumed by cash app sales, and the other quarter to get close to around half um, was grayscale, and so. You know, I like I, I like Cash App. I think for a KYC service, um, they're pretty out in the open. Um, they don't try to hide what they are or disguise that. But I think that that's something to think about in terms of where is the liquidity going to go, um, you know, in the years to come. Like, where are you actually going to be able to get your hands on Bitcoin at a not insane premium, um, you know, without dealing with that, without dealing with the KYC, without having to jump through a whole bunch of hoops or, or pay a premium or potentially break laws to get around that? And just how is that distribution between those things really going to play out? Because... This is just two services in one country. And I mean, that is really something I think that we all need to kind of stop and step back for a minute and have a think on in terms of how that's going to play out and what that is going to make this ecosystem look like in five years. Because that growth isn't just going to stop and turn off overnight well i mean uh you got anything you want to toss in on that or do we want to lighten the mood with some comedy at the end uh yeah it's def well it's comedic and um also rather good news because um it you know if i understand it correctly um you know, this month is already exciting with, you know, the price jumping up and the halving uh, and the 10th anniversary of Pizza Day also. Um, but it's possible that this whole, uh, all these shenanigans with uh, fake Toshi may soon be coming to an end because um, Arthur Van Pelt from Dragon Industries shared a few days ago that um, basically Ira Kleiman had... Uh, file a uh, quote uh, intends to file a sanctions motion based on defendant's conduct in these proceedings this motion will include but not be limited to the defendant's provision of a false notice and false list of bitcoin addresses in response to this court's order allowing him uh through and including february 3rd 2020 to file a notice uh with the court indicating whether or not this mysterious figure has now appeared from the shadows and whether the defendant now has access to the last key slice needed to unlock the encrypted file um, that was the whole carrier business uh, and then since yesterday um, 
or yesterday, since then, uh, Fake Toshi filed a motion for summary judgment, which if you're not familiar with legalese, essentially means I don't want to continue with a full trial. Please make a, please judge, make a, you know, overall conclusion on the merits of the case, as long as they can't find any genuine dispute on material facts, which, uh, well, they're probably is still a bunch of that but who knows um it's possible there even if there is dispute that the judge may agree to do summary judgment if both parties agree but uh arthur also tweeted links to other court documents that are probably going to be the most relevant in the event of a summary judgment uh, including the statement of material facts and then the videotaped deposition of um, his uh, Craig Wright's wife, Miss Lynn Carroll, right, in which she was asked, did you ever hear Dave and Craig talk about Bitcoin and did you have any knowledge of Craig referring to Dave as his business partner, to which she replied uh, in both cases, no, despite the fact that she was pretty deeply involved in Craig Wright's business administration during that whole relevant period. Um, so yeah, def uh, he also did a breakdown of the notable sections from those documents and the impact of them. So check out that thread, which will be linked in the description. What? Oh, you mean, oh shit, he put evidence into motion that contradicted him and the other side might have even more that does that? What? Oh. Yeah, I mean, he continues to just stick his own foot in his mouth. It was really funny. I forget the company, but I actually saw Mr. Hoddle tweet something about in 2000, like the early 2000s in Wales, I think it was. He actually uh, got arrested and was going to get thrown in jail for 28 days because he was approaching a former employee's customers, um, which he had a... Uh, restriction legally on doing and got out of it by agreeing to um, community service after just trying to get out of it clean through multiple appeals and um, it looks like he never even did the community service for that whoops <laughs> it's just really funny when you when you, you see situations like this and you think on the idioms um that you, you hear through your childhood. You know, like, it's it's always going to catch up to you. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, as, a, an, as an isolated incident, it's funny enough, but when you also consider the fact that he still claim, well, I haven't checked, but when I last looked, he still claims to be a lawyer, which is actually illegal in the UK. You're not allowed to claim to be a lawyer when you're not, and you can be put in prison for that. And he also constantly LARPs about, you know, how, the you know, Bitcoin is not intended to break the law. Um, you know, cr you're all criminals if you think so. The law is stronger than code, blah, blah, blah. It's like, buddy, <laughs> I don't think you're in any position to lecture people about the law. <laughs> You seriously got to make like a holiday when this finally just implodes and he gets convicted in court on something like it needs to be that 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 needs to get added as a holiday in the yearly cycle. I, I think that merits a Bitcoin holiday. Maybe it should be pie day to keep with the theme of food. <laughs> pie and pie pie in the face day. Oh, man. Yeah. Fucking Craig. Or maybe uh, Faust loses a uh, deal with the devil. We we will think on this and we will solve this. We we will meme this and this will happen. Mm hmm. Alrighty. Guess uh, that that wraps it up for the day. Uh, got a final thought. Um, I might need to go looking for one, but my brief final thought right now is that if you have lots of money, especially millions of dollars, um, learn how to use folders and maybe change your passwords every 
couple of years, especially if they're bad. Whee! Just a thought. Leave the video games alone. All right, yeah, I'm kind of, yep, plumbed out on final thoughts. Uh, the happening is going to be coming, folks. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what's going on. And yeah, um, Bitcoin's totally going to crash. Um, sell everything. This is all going to die, guys. How do you not see the writing on your wall? You, you just get out while you can, you fucking idiots. Enragement is engagement. Ding, 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 ding. Are we going to do a having day live stream? I don't know if that's possible because you'll be sleeping. <laughs> uh, let's talk about it after the show and we can see if last minute slapstick logistics make sense on that. But we'll see. On that note, though, uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. Catch you later, punks. Pineapple pizza is good. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>